So uh, it, it really is uh, a great pleasure to be here, and even more so. I mean, I <clears throat> really like the location in terms of you know where we are, but also in terms of where I am in uh, in the agenda. Because in particular, after the talks that we heard yesterday and this morning, in many ways, uh, what I'm going to speak about uh, that will be a continuation of. Um, Tommaso Lorenzo's work, and I say Tommaso's work, but in fact, pretty much most of his co-authors are here in the audience, uh, including Jean and Benoit, so uh, we'll get there. Really, what I, I, I'm planning to speak about is drug resistance and cancer. And one of the uh, you know things that I should say is that this is a joint work with uh, a collection of former students, postdoc, and there are some doctors, so these are the main people that are involved. And, um, you know, there's always a question when doing mathematical models, why do we do mathematical models? Why do we bother writing mathematical models? So the purpose is not to have a mathematical model. The question is to do something with it. Now we know that the underlying biology is very, very complex. And most of the time when we write these mathematical models, I feel as if you know, we're chasing after some biological information that either does not exist or we don't know. Um, and in any event, it's not always clear, even if we get our mathematical models up and running, what can we do with them? So I'll try to reverse a little bit things today and in some sense start with you know, my dream, and that is what could we potentially do with math if we knew everything biologically? Okay, so, so I know it's very ambitious, and as you'll see, I'll call it science fiction, but um, we'll try to approach that science fiction. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about multi-drug resistance, and then I'll tell you how you know, we can start thinking about this from a mathematical perspective. So if you ask uh, biologists what are mechanisms of drug resistance, uh, this is pretty much a caricature of the picture they'll give you. And um, if you want to read you know, an excellent review, I highly recommend this paper by Gillian Gottesman. Uh, and I know it was published about eight years ago, but you know there are some new molecular details and things like that. But in terms of the mechanisms themselves, this is a fantastic source. And what you see here is you know a cell. And when you think about all the things that a drug has to do in order to fight the cell, essentially to kill the cell, then um, here are some things it has to do. One thing it has to do is to get into the cell. And uh, you know, there are various mechanisms that cells have developed in order to get rid of the drug that goes into the cell. So we heard yesterday a talk about PGP, and a PGP is an example of an ABC transporter, and that is these pumps that develop on the membrane of the cell and spit the drug out as, a, as the drug enters. Okay, so how can you fight these ABC transporters? Well, it's quite difficult, because as you administer drugs, these transporters develop on the membrane of the cell, and they're not permanently there. They will be there for a while, and then they'll go away. But you administer drug again, and they will come back on the membrane of the cell. And uh, you know, one thing you can do is you can give a lot of drug so that the cell cannot pump it out efficiently. But of course, if you do that, you're messing up with toxicity. So that's something you know, to think about. Now, once this, the drug enters into the cell, all sorts of things can happen to it. For example, it can be engulfed and metabolized and various other processes. Essentially, think about the goal is to penetrate the nucleus and to destroy the DNA. But as we all know, there are DNA repair mechanisms. Uh, if it gives an apoptotic signal to the cell, well, there are anti-apoptotic signals that can happen, and so on and so forth. So in other words, you know, 
We'll try to simplify the picture and speak about drug resistance as a property of the cell. But it really is something that if you think biologically about what's going on, it is very, very complex. Now, as much as biology is complex, uh, complex for mathematicians, it turns out that mathematics is very complex for biologists. And uh, several years back, uh, we were asked uh, to write a, um, a paper in a special issue of drug resistance update that was dedicated for uh, a 30 years anniversary of discovering ABC transporters. And everything there was, um, you know, clinical or experimental paper. But we were asked to write a paper about how mathematicians think about drug resistance. So what do we do? And the, this was by far the most difficult paper I've ever written because it had no math in it. Uh, it was trying to explain math to doctors. But that's not necessarily bad because it make, made us go back and think about all sorts of things that are happening in that community and uh, what kind of questions people ask. So here are three samples of questions that mathematicians ask about drug resistance. One, of course, goes to the optimal control problem. So if you can you know, control the dose of the drug and the scheduling of the drug, the timing of the drug, you know, how do you, so what should you do? And of course, in order to solve an optimal control problem, you need a target, and the target typically is to maximize the damage to the tumor and minimize toxicity, okay? So that's an example, and there's a whole uh, work, and I, this is a very, very short list of references. Uh, in any event, that's one example. The other example, and it is not unrelated to the first question, is you know you can administer drug in many different ways. So for example, should you administer it continuously or should you go and do it in bursts? Okay, so that's, or, or maybe something else, okay? So, so that is yet another example of a question. And it is related, yes, and yeah, I'm not saying that they're completely decoupled, of course. And uh, a third example is, um, you know, when you have several drugs that are available, should you administer them sequentially? Should you administer them together? And it's very interesting because, you know, uh, <clears throat> Doctors do not care about what we tell them from the math. There really are two approaches. In the old days, it was, well, if I have three drugs, I can treat a patient. I'll treat the patient with drug number one. And then if that doesn't work, I'll treat the patient with drug number two. And if that doesn't work, I'll treat the patient with drug number three. Now, it's pretty much the opposite. It's like, well, let's just throw everything we have at the patient. And if that doesn't work, okay. Uh, so, uh, which probably, from um, you know, if you look at the results of the math, that's the correct approach, by the way. Okay, so uh, we heard a lot about tumor heterogeneity, uh, and this is really something, because when we're going to speak about drug resistance and mathematical models of drug resistance, the one important thing to remember is that, you know, the tumor is a very, very complex environment. So. What is the typical kind of experiment you see out there with people that study tumor heterogeneity? Well, they take a tissue, okay, they take a tumor, they, and then they take a cell from the tumor, and they take another cell from a different location of the tumor, and maybe a third cell or a fourth cell, something like that, you know, four or five cells. They'll sequence these cells, they'll look at the genome and say, oh, the genome is different. And the conclusion is, that the tumor is heterogeneous. So there are many papers like that out there. And uh, you know, what does it really mean? Well, it does mean different things to <laughs> different people. But uh, for us, at least at minimum, we can say, well, OK, yeah, the tumor is heterogeneous. Now, as we heard today, and we all know that the genome does not tell us the full picture. So here is uh, an example of a group I'm working with, um, an experimental group at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Uh, and Shelley Payton uh, did the following experiment where they grew triple negative breast cancer cells in 3D gels, and no drug, okay? You just take cells and grow them in a gel. And yes, it's a cell line, but all these cells are completely identical to each other. There's no difference between one cell or the other. And what is plotted here are results of two of their experiments in which 
Uh, so that's kind of a cell lineage diagram in which we monitor over time uh, what do these cells do in terms of proliferation. And as you see, so a cell that here in the bottom, what this does, it doesn't do anything. It does not divide. Okay, the cell in the top, on the other hand, it divides at this time point, then it continues dividing and continues dividing. So you see these cells, and the X at the very end represents a cell death. Okay, so sometimes they die, sometimes they divide, sometimes they divide a lot, and all these cells are identical. There's no difference between them. So, genetically identical. Of course they're not identical, but genetically they're identical. Genetically, they are. Okay, they're, you know, basically twins, right? Okay. So, um, uh, uh, by the way, amigos, so that's, <laughs> what's that, amigos? Um, so, <laughs> the National Cancer Institute organize, wanted to organize some workshop on uh, breast cancer and math. So, um, they spent a lot of, resources, and they also spent a lot of energy finding, looking for an acronym for this conference, okay? It was a small thing, like 25 people. So AMIGO stands for Applied Mathematics in Germinating Oncology Solutions. Okay. <laughs> so um, he, here is my dream, okay? Here is my dream. So that's the ultimate goal, and that's what I call science fiction. So. Imagine, imagine, imagine the following. Imagine that we can know the initial data. That is, when a tumor is diagnosed, we can map whatever we refer to as heterogeneity, whether it's genomic or epigenomic or whatnot. We can map it precisely. And we know every cell, what is it going to do in response to the drug. So here, here's a picture, okay? So yeah, this, these cells uh, do something, these cells do something else, and so on and so forth. Now, imagine, let's take it one step further. Imagine that we can fully control the treatment, that uh, we can administer the drug or any number of drugs in any way we know, in any way we want, okay? Imagine we can do that. And let's take it even one step further and imagine that dynamically we can see exactly what's happening all the time. So obviously we can't do any of this stuff. But let's say we could. So now comes the mathematical question is, what should we do? So I'm taking it on purpose to that extreme and I'm saying even if we knew everything, which clearly will never happen, but even if we, do ev we knew everything, what should we do? So what is the optimal treatment? And of course, the question that you should ask is, what is optimal? So what are we trying to do? Can we get rid of the tumor? Well, that is super optimal. We cannot. Can we, uh, of course, if there is some resistance, we cannot, okay? Uh, so what should we do? Should we turn it into a chronic state where you know, the tumor shrinks and then we let it grow and so on and so forth, and just like, you know, maybe extend the life expectancy of the patient? Or maybe we should target particular cells there? Or what should we, what should we do? Okay, so that's the kind of question that is going to lead the math. And that's how I like to think about this. Okay, now I'm going to run through various examples or whatever, but before I do that, there is one figure I, uh, so if I wanted you to, get, to remember one thing from this talk, well, here it is. So let's not wait until it, you know, to the place where it belongs. So this is out of context. This is the one figure that I want you to remember. And in fact, forget uh, the upper part, we'll get to that in a second. Um, look at the middle part. So what I'm showing here is I'm showing um, <clears throat> what happens when you increase a, a drug dosage, a cytotoxic drug. So this is a low dosage, this is a higher dosage, and this is an even higher dosage. And what these figures represent is some mean resistance level, so that would be the vertical axis, where zero corresponds to fully sensitive cells and one corresponds to fully resistant cells, just the way uh, we saw previously with Tomas's talk. And this is what happens over time. So take a look at the difference between this picture, this picture, and that picture. 
As you increase the dosage, you observe two things happening. One of them is there is this blank space here. And what is that? That is really remission. This is the drug is effective and we do not see the cancer. Can't, numbers went down to zero. So as the drug dosage increases, what you see is a later remission. But what that also does, it comes at the expense of a relapse with more resistant cells. Okay, so this curve is higher than that, this curve is higher than that, you get more resistant cells. Well, in fact, well, I can tell you now, like if this is when you administer a drug continuously over time. If instead of administering a drug continuously, I'll administer it as an on-off scheduling, what you will see actually is with the same you know, dosage per given amount of time, this is actually worse. I will get to that, yeah. So I told you this is out of context, but that's the one figure I want you to remember. That increasing the drug dosage may not necessarily do well when you think about resistance. Okay, okay. so thinking about that, let us uh, take a little break from this figure and let me show you the simplest, is that a question? No, no, okay, sorry. It's the simplest possible model, because I told you the problem is very complex, but since uh, you know, I'm talking about drug resistance, let me try to advocate that sometimes it's not a bad idea to do things simply. So what would be the simplest possible model for drug resistance? Uh, the simplest possible model is, you know, you can just take a deterministic approach with a single drug where you assume that there are two cell populations. One is a, set, a population that is a wild type pop population that responds to the drug, and the other population would be a population that is resistant to the drug. So what can I do? I can write Basically, I, I can simplify everything and assume that they have the same growth rate and the same death rate. So there is a time, let's call it T star, when the tumor is diagnosed. And the tumor is diagnosed, before that, both cell types grow. And I'm thinking about uh, wild type developing into resistant cell during a process of cell division. That's why I'm not even subtracting that you and from the first equation. After the tumor is diagnosed, I'm applying a drug. As I said, there are cells that are resistant to the drug, so that you know, nothing really happens with their dynamics, while there is a death rate that goes with the sensitive cells. Okay, so you can't go any simpler than that. And um, you can think about the initial conditions where you have no zero cells, no, no resistant cells at time zero, and some wild type cells at time zero, and just see what happens. Now that's a linear system of ODEs. Very simple. So you can solve it and get all sorts of results of that. Now, whether they are biologically relevant or not, well, this is very, very simple. But before I do something complex, I want to start with something simple, okay? So uh, one thing you can do, for example, is to study the amount of resistance that is present when the treatment starts, because you can just solve the equation and compute that. So uh, one thing that is interesting about this is that when you compute that, you do get a result that says that the resistance does depend on the birth and death rate, as you would expect. Um, which, by the way, if you look at the mathematical literature, you'll see works that were published that reach a different conclusion. Okay, so even with the simplest possible model, you can reach all sorts of interesting conclusions. Nevertheless, you can go and extend it to a true drug case, just the same thing, okay? Uh, there's one drug, there's a second drug, there's resistance to both drugs, and I mean, in fact, answering the same question gives you a similar expression, pretty much raises the power here to two, take more drugs, you'll just raise the power, and so on and so forth. What you can then do, for example, is to start asking all sorts of questions like, okay, here a tumor was diagnosed, we started treating it. There was resistance that developed before the treatment. There was resistance that developed after the treatment. It, you know, which one is bigger? Okay, that's an OD model, it's a linear OD model. You can easily solve it. And you know, the pre, uh, under reasonable assumptions, the pre-treatment resistance is, you know, what you expect. 
No, the, the treatment is basically is continuous. You start administering at time t star, and only the uh, cells that are sensitive to one of the drugs or more respond. The resistant cells, fully resistant, do not respond. So it's a very, very simple thing. Now, I'm emphasizing that you can do simple things because um, when you look at the literature of drug resistance and cancer, you see a lot of things that are not simple, mathematically speaking. And in fact, one of the biggest mysteries to me when I started looking at drug resistance was the following. Well, why in our community of people that try to do mathematical oncology, studying drug resistance and studying tumor growth have been pretty much decoupled? So we saw today an example of a Tommaso's talk uh, where people start thinking about, you know, what does a drug resistance look like through the process of tumor growth? But there are almost no works like that out there. Well, here's the answer. Um, well, one possible answer. The dimensionality kills you mathematically. So if we think about tumor growth, if we want to actually model tumor growth in 3D in space, plus time, right? And then we think about a continuous variable that's a response to a drug, uh, in terms of response to a drug. Well, one drug, how about three drugs? It becomes a very highly dimensional problem. So that is difficult. Okay, and I think that is the reason why most of us, well, definitely me, avoided it in the past. We'll get there. I think we can do it. Okay, so uh, on to tumor heterogeneity, and we understand tumor heterogeneity in many ways. What I want to start with, because I do want to get to the spatial case, is with a non-spatial case, and this is nothing but uh, the approach that Jean and Benoit and Tommaso and Alex Lortz, who's not here, and the other co-authors uh, took when thinking about uh, tumor heterogeneity. And I'm not getting into how do you move from the molecular understanding of drug resistance into this continuum parameter. I'll show you some examples of how you can you know, move away or do some things with it, even without going back to the molecular understanding. Nevertheless, uh, I, I, this is really what I have in mind. So my trait is the resistance level that is considered to be a continuous parameter. And the equation that you will get as a result of um, thinking about a continuous parameter, if you think about the different processes that go with it, can look uh, like that. And what will it look like? Well, N would be my cancer cells, and their change in time has you know, a growth, an effective growth term that involves growth, it's here, and death as a result of the drug, a natural death. And uh, they can mutate. Okay. X is not space. X is this resistance level. I'm going to change the notations in a second when I get to space, but let's keep X as a trait, the resistance level. And what is uh, uh, written here, rho, I call it density. It's not density. There's no space. It's just the total number of drug, of, of cancer cells. And uh, the interesting variation here compared with, with uh, the original work are, is that, that these quantities, everything here, can depend on the density. That can depend on other things as well. So the growth rate can depend on the density. And that's an interesting thing. So you know, part of trying to understand these questions, we went back to conducting some very basic experiments. So we took cancer cells and grew them on a plate. And what do you see? Well, you see some very, very interesting, very interesting things. Um, everyone tells you that, in, you know, that cancer growth is such that if the density is low, you get an exponential growth and exponential growth, and then you get a saturation as the density goes up. But um, you know, we conducted experiments. We don't necessarily even see that. Sometimes what we see is a picture where, uh, you know, when you put few cancer cells, they actually don't grow that fast. When there are a lot of them, they do. 
but it's somewhere in the middle where you see the exponential growth starting to kick in. So I'm not sure that, you know, if you go and, you know, if in the body, for instance, and this is in vitro, but if I now try to project on what's happening in the body, if, you know, all of us have, let's say, 10 cancer cells at this point in time, doesn't mean that they are exponentially growing. I don't think that's the case. Okay, it has to go beyond a certain threshold for that to kick. This is just basic experiment. So what I'm trying to say is that not necessarily a linear dependence. Uh, things can change quite a bit in turn. And so we have all these density dependent terms. So uh, you can rescale everything and rewrite everything like that that looks cleaner. So you have a growth term, things can mutate. There's a mutation kernel. Take it symmetric. I'll take it in a second non-symmetric, but let's start with something symmetric. Symmetric is a bit silly. That goes back and forth, but let's still keep it symmetric. And uh, you can scale everything that you can throw the density dependent on one place. And now you can start studying what such an equation does. And what an equation like that does is uh, here, let me simplify it and do it in stages. Let me take everything and remove the density. This is nothing but the original model of cancer cells. Then I'll go on to the second model and I'll add the density. And finally, I'll kick in the mutation. So what happens with that? Well, the first thing, which is the original model, uh, what you get is uh, a, a limit distribution of delta functions the density is unbounded. So you can prove that. In fact, if you look at the original paper, you'd see that the original distribution was uh, either at uh, zero, the fully sensitive, or fully resistant. So the cells went there. To change that, all that you really have to do is to think about a different you know, effective growth rate and move away from the linear stuff where you'll have a point where the, this difference is maximized, that will be here, and that is where the limit distribution will develop. Okay, so if you take that and you add to it uh, a density effect, and I, I, here the only thing I'm really assuming is that this function here uh, is unbounded, then uh, you still get in the limit delta functions, but the density, the density is just the total number of cells, is bounded. If you go one step further and add the mutations, you get a limit distribution that is with a bounded density, but you no longer have the, these Dirac masses. What you have is something with, yeah, with, with uh, some you know, non-zero variance. And this is, since this axis here is my trade space, the resistant le resistance level, then I will refer to that as tumor heterogeneity. Okay, so this, uh, these are elements that will repeat in the other models. Okay, so now if I take this thing and I want to do a spatial model, the first thing that I do is I look what, at what people have done before us. So again, that's another paper of the same group, uh, in which they consider the radially symmetric case. So let me quickly run through it, and what do you have here? You have an equation for the cancer cells. Cancer cells were, what you have is a growth term. A growth term comes from here. It's impacted by the resources, and you allow here for a cytostatic drug that is assumed, unlike what we heard earlier today, in this case, the cytostatic drug is assumed to slow down the proliferation rate. And um, by the way, in this case, T is time R is the distance. You're looking at the radially symmetric case. So R is the distance from the center of the cell. And theta, theta not X, is the resistance level. So that is what this model looks like. And uh, so you have the death as a result, the natural death rate and death as a result of the cytotoxic drug, and you have additional equations. One is for the nutrients. They play a role in the growth. There's an equation for the cytostatic drug that can kill the cancer cells with this term, and there's an equation for the cytostatic drug that will just slow down the growth rate. Now, this is a very nice work, but there is something a little bit... Um, unusual about it, because this is a radially symmetric model. So this is our tumor. 
And what this equation looks at is basically you look at distance r from the center and all these cells that are here sitting in distance r from the center, they have a distribution of resistance in the phenotype space. So these cells in this model don't go anywhere. What goes, I mean, they, they, can, they stay there. They can grow, they can die, but they, they can't move here. It's not in this model. So let's make them move, okay? So let's take this model and modify a little bit. And here is how we modify it. Modify it in several ways. One is we allow them to move. We allow them to diffuse. The other thing that we do is we make all these diffusion terms depend on the density. And the third thing that we do is we make sure that the cytostatic, that the cytotoxic drug may depend on the dosage. So it's not, um, uh, the, the effect depends on the dosage. Okay, so, uh, you know, I, I give more drug than I may kill more. Okay, okay. so um, let, let's see what simulations of this model, and this is still a radially symmetric model, and second we'll go to the non-radially symmetric model, but what does simulations of this model do? Well, one thing that, uh, before they do, I want to mention another thing, and that is, if you look at these terms, P and mu, so let me go back to the, pre to the previous equations. Mu is, um, no, mu one is here. So, sorry, sorry about that, here. Mu sits here. Mu is really the action of the, uh, of the cytotoxic drug. So it's a drug uptake. I didn't write what C is, but that, that's what it is. So it's, C would be some mu times C1. So one function that we care about is the response to the drug. Another function that we care about is the response to the nutrients, so the growth uptake function. So the original paper had linear functions for these. We move on to nonlinear function. We can explain where this comes from, but that is something that avoids the delta at the boundary. So this is a picture that I showed you before. This is a radially symmetric case. If you use the linear stuff, oh, if you use, a, that's not the picture I showed you before, it'll come in a second. If I use a linear model, I get concentration. Here is theta, that's a level of resistance. I, this is a fully sensitive cells. A bit difficult to see them, but they're here. If you use a nonlinear uptake functions, you don't go to the boundaries. And now the picture that I showed you previously. Nonlinear just refers to the uptake functions. So while the original model will end up with cells that are either concentrated and fully resistant or the fully sensitive cells, here you no longer see the case. And we discussed that figure previously, okay? And here is another way of looking at it. See, as you increase the drug dosage, you get a later relapse, okay? But with more resistance, resistant cells, that's not shown here because this is just a density as a function of time. So now you can uh, ask for the role of the uh, different terms in, uh, in, in such a model, and you can study different regions. For example, if I remove for a second the no cell diffusion, and I plot the resistance level compared with the distance from the origin, so this is the center of the tumor, and this is the boundary. And when I say increased diffusion of nutrients, that means that this has higher nutrients from, than here, but really the diffusion comes from the right boundary. It just comes from the outside. Everything, both the drug and the nutrients come from the outside into the domain. And what you see in this case is that uh, with a high diffusion of nutrients, high diffusion of nutrients that's here, then the cancer cell grows next to the center because the food gets to the center of the tumor. But if uh, the diffusion of the nutrients is low, it doesn't get there, okay? The other thing is what you can compare between low, low drug diffusion and high drug diffusion, and again, everything diffuses from here. You get a higher heterogeneity 
in the low drug diffusion case because the cells next to the boundary feel the drug. The cells inside the tumor do not. Now I know that most of the cells inside the tumor are dead. We'll get to that in a second. This is a radially symmetric case. Okay. So here's another way of viewing it. Let me skip that. With cell diffusion, uh, the picture becomes a little bit more interesting. And um, you know, the cells can move between these different R's. So you know, cells that could not feel the drug that were here, of course, as they approach the boundary, they could feel the drug. So you see a little bit more interesting dynamics. But the most interesting picture for this model is this one. So uh, what does it mean? Well, this is theta, the level of resistance, fully resistant cells, fully sensitive. And this is R, the distance from the center of the cell. And what you see here, and this is a picture is you know, just a, a result of a simulation after a certain time. But what you see here is that two levels of resistance develop. So the area here has one dominant, this area of level of resistance, while the area here has a lower level of resistance. So this is really nice in my view, because this shows that the model supports developing tumor heterogeneity. It's not just everything has to be continuous. All of a sudden, I can get something that if this was the fully 2 or 3D model, would probably look like that. There is an area where there's a certain level of resistance, a different area where there's a different level of resistance. Okay. And you do need the diffusion and the different term and to make them density dependent, so on and so forth, to get these pictures. OK, so uh, you can then ask for the role of mutation. So here are two examples. One thing you can do, you can take the symmetric mutation kernel and turn it to, to asymmetric. What do I mean by that? Instead of assuming that cells mutate both ways, I can just say, well, they'll just mutate to a more highly higher resistance level, and they will not go backwards in the resistance level. Well, if you do that, then you indeed break the symmetry in the solution, and you get these asymmetric discretization, you get shifting, but you also get shifting towards higher resistance level. So that's one thing that you see. In fact, you don't even have to do it that way. You can say, well, maybe I do not believe to begin with all your assumptions, right? Maybe, you know, thinking about resistance level as something that is continuous and always happens and you know, with continuous process, maybe that's the wrong approach. Maybe you should think of jump processes. Maybe they're really a collection of some discrete states. So I will still think about resistance as being a, you know, a continuous variable, but I'll say something special happens here. Something special happens here. Something special happens here. And you can do that through this mutation kernel. And uh, you can shift to some mutation kernel that has these jumps built in. And indeed, what you see in this case see these funny curves, so this is the level of resistance from 0 to 1 at whatever time that I plotted it here. And what happens is that the cancer cells will move towards these areas where something special happened in the resistance space, and then they will make the jump. That kind of takes more effort to do. Okay. So this is pretty much as much as I can uh, squeeze out of a radially symmetric model. So now let me move on to a non-radially symmetric model. Now, there's a very nice feature of the radially symmetric model, and that is, you know, you, know, you always solve this without moving the boundary. The boundary is always one. Right, or you can scale it to whatever you want. So you always work with this problem. You have your fixed domain. Well, if now I want to do a similar thing with a 2D model, let's say 2D uh, in space, uh, then you know this is of course mathematically more complex. So I have to choose a model to go with this whole thing, and we have the expertise in the room, right? Why uh, why shouldn't we just go to a, one of the previous works? And you can pick your favorite model for tumor growth, but this is definitely one of my favorites, so we work with that. So that's uh, an older Benoit model where uh, we couple the previous ideas, and that's written here, with this model of tumor growth. 
So you think about the growth being something that is happening as a result of a homeostatic pressure. That is a heavy side function. So you have a certain growth. The growth pretty much looks, you know, the effect of growth, death rate, and uh, natural death rate, and death rate as a result of the cytotoxic drug. Um, <clears throat> looks pretty much the way it was before, but you have to remember that we are no longer looking at the radially symmetric case, so this all happens inside of the domain. And you take all that stuff and you put it in the growth term, and something really bad happened here. Uh, I knew Microsoft and Mac should not work together. Okay, you must be kidding me. Um, okay, go back there. And that was not a button. Okay, nothing I pressed there. Good. So the full 2D problem, um, so, so you take the growth term and you take a diffusion, and the other thing is you have here this velocity. Okay, so I take that and I couple it with everything we had before. So the nutrients, the cytotoxic drug, and the cytostatic drug. Boundary, now you have to deal with, uh, you know, that's not radially symmetric, so you can put the nutrients on the boundary and I told you, I'll, uh, I'm allowing myself to assume that I can administer the drugs any way I want to, so I can put them on the boundary, I can diffuse them into the domain, whatever you want. And you can consider different types of initial data. So for example, you can start with initial data, and here what we see, so red is resistance, blue is sensitive. So I'm thinking about the phenotype so these are four different types of initial data. Something that's like a Gaussian here, something that has blobs of areas that are more resistant. This is just, you know, whatever you want, okay? So just to see what a model like that will support. And in addition, you can think about different ways of administering a drug. And, um, you know, one way you can do is I'll administer it symmetrically from all over. The other thing, I'll go from the top and have the drug diffuse and the nutrients diffuse from the top of the domain. And the third thing that I'll do is, mm, I do not want to get into um, all the vasculature and where the oxygen is and whatever with this kind of model. So I'll pick the easy path and I will follow something that I like that Mark and his co-authors did in recent paper in which they just assume that the drug can be administered from certain areas and cannot be administered from others. So they're, okay, so just to create some heterogeneity in the way the drug is administered. And now let's look at what's happening. So first thing we of course ask, is that a good model for cancer growth? And we like it because yes, a necrotic core can develop. So I start with this and you see the tumor uh, and so the picture of the tumor depends on the motility constants, and the motility constants are, you know, the diffusion term and the velocity term. So you can get different pictures, of course. But take a look at this picture here, and what you see is, what you see in this picture is at a certain time, uh, <clears throat> the tumor grows until it reaches density one, and then it starts expanding. So that's the typical behavior you see here. The tumor growth density goes to one, it starts expanding, and the necrotic core develops in the center. So that's, that's a model I like, because it has these features. You can even, if you wish, to do some math, you can estimate the velocity of the boundary, and, um, but, but we are coupling this model with resistance. So when I couple this model with resistance, what do I see? I see the same thing that I've seen before. So look at that picture here. Uh, <clears throat> what you see here is there's a tumor. At a later time, you don't see the tumor. And at a later time, you see the tumor back, but it's red. Red means bad, okay, that's resistant. Here, this is orange, it's less bad than red. What's the difference between this line and that line? This is a low dosage of the cytotoxic drug, this is a higher dosage. Higher dosage, you see a relapse, Tumor comes back, resistant. Okay, uh, you can even do the math and estimate the time of relapse. Uh, so you can get a lower bound on the time of relapse and every curve here corresponds to a different initial density and each dot on this curve corresponds to a different level of the cytotoxic drug. So you can basically get 
uh, an estimate of what that thing will look like. That's a time of the relapse. Okay, the time of the, this is the relapse. So of course you have to define what a relapse means. So okay, crossing a certain threshold and so on and so forth. But that is what it is. Now, <clears throat> I can ask the same question as before. What happens if I have a continuous drug administration compared with on-off? Same thing here. The solid line course, so the mean phenotype means a resistance level. So this, the, the, the dashed line, the blue dashed line is continuous. Here, continuous. These two curves are for on-off drug administration, and what you get is a higher resistance level as a result of that. <clears throat> you can then go and see what happens with a trait. So here is the initial tumor, and as the drug level goes, so what I show here is the density of the tumor, and I see the mean phenotype level. Here, there's no drug. So the nutrients diffuse from the top. Here, there is drug and, the, and nutrients, and they both diffuse from the top. So the tumor grows more in that direction because that's where the nutrients are. But uh, as there's no drug, if that's your initial phenotype distribution, you know, you have lots of sensitive cells and some resistant cells. However, if you give a lot of drug, you know, you'll get a smaller tumor, but they will, it will be more resistant. You know, so the more drug you give, you know, the smaller the tumor you'll get, but it will be more resistant. This is the same picture with a different initial configuration. Same thing, you know, no drug, sensitive cells have space to live. Of course, then makes you think, so can I use this to my advantage? Because when I hit the tumor with a drug, what you do essentially, you select it for the cells that don't respond to the drug. So maybe we should give these sensitive cells some space to proliferate because we can deal with them, right? Okay, so uh, you can also show the emergence of heterogeneity. Drug diffuses from, uh, from the top, and what you see here, this is the density of the tumor. That's where the tumor is. This is the mean resistance level. So you see in the tumor, I have an area that's very resistant because that's closer to the drug and an area that's not as resistant. And of course, you can administer the drug from various different directions. One of my favorite pictures is this one. Here is what happens in this model when the tumor grows up. There's no drug in this picture, but in this environment in which the uh, drugs are, the, the nutrients are administered, and you see that you get this irregular boundary, and it's kind of weird, because this obviously have absolutely nothing to do with the biology. I didn't take that picture from anything biological, but if you actually look at the biology, and you look at what the boundaries of tumors look like, there are various cases, sometimes you see isolated cells, sometimes you see these very long things, but sometimes you see something that looks like that, and you know, maybe with some imagination you can see the similarity. So in any event, um, while not biological in terms of the, uh, the, the configuration here, um, yeah, there's something that comes, you know, that you can do. So, uh, optimizing drugs, so here's the sad thing. Yeah, you can't get rid of the tumor. You cannot. You cannot, yeah, you can try to play with different drugs, you cannot do it, but you can do something. So for example, um, something you can do is you can actually change your target. And you can say, well, if the tumor has different levels of resistance, maybe I can get rid of the most resistant cells somehow. And by um, cleverly working with a cytostatic drug and a cytotoxic drug, that can be done. Okay, so you can reduce the level of the tumor load. Uh, we just heard about uh, <clears throat> non-small cell lung cancer, so I mean, you can take all that stuff and actually connect it with data, but in order to, uh, so, so as, a, as a, okay, so here, here is a result, the, uh, you know, and a result about something that I, I so, so something I did not speak about previously, something else that the high dosage does. So what you see here is, Constant, meaning uh, uniform diffusion of drug around the tumor, well, uh, compared with the diffusive drug and nutrients coming from the top. And the top line shows the tumor density, then you have the mean phenotype level. You see here, as, you know, in this case, a more resistant tumor than this one. But you also see here the variance and the resistance level. 
And you do get, in certain cases, uh, a higher variance, a greater variance in the resistance level, and that is not good. Okay, so that's also something you can study from here. Uh, in um, <clears throat> the last uh, two minutes that I have, I will comment briefly about two additional things. One is, well, you know, I said that the dim dimensionality is high, and it is. Now, what happens if I want to study many drugs, and I want some of the drugs to be cell cycle specific, some non-cell cycle specific, some cytostatic, whatnot? Okay, it's, it's difficult, but forget the mathematical difficulties. The reality is that there's very little experimental data there out there to show how these drugs act together. And if we had them, we wouldn't have to go and assume this sort of nonsense assumption in which, for example, if I administer several cytostatic drugs, the action will be additive. Why would it be? Or if I administer several cytotoxic drugs, they will be independent from each other. But tell me what they do. I'll change these functions. Okay, you can adjust this to the drugs. Uh, nevertheless, uh, one thing that is important is that you can uh, then go and based on, you know, you can go and use these papers and revisit all sorts of work that people have been doing in the drug resistance community. Example is the Wodart, Komarova and Wodart's work in which they had several drugs, but with two states, resistant and sensitive. And if you replace that study with a continuous study, lo and behold, you get different conclusions. Their conclusion of that paper was that in the high turnover case, yes, where the death rate and birth date are similar, using more drugs is not effective. Go and use one drug. Well, I do a continuum model, I get the reverse conclusion. This is what happens to the tumor size as you increase the number of drugs. One drug, two drug, you know, five drugs, uh, four drugs. Okay, so. so it actually does make a difference. It's not surprising because it's this not the. This is theoretical thing, right? It's not experimental. This is this one is theoretical. This is theoretical. Uh, going and revisiting there. If you want to look at experimental data, you can. Uh, one source that is out there is a paper of Gardner for 2002 that checked six drugs and actually had three resistance levels. So there's Herceptin, doxyrubicin, there's tamoxifen, there's all the so all these you know different types of drugs and their conclusions. Of course, if you do everything continuous you'll get different conclusions, okay? Um, so uh, to do everything continuous, pretty much what I need is I need to take these data points and connect them with a curve. Or get some other experimental data, okay? So you can do all that stuff. If you wish, you can then go and uh, do a competition between healthy cells and cancer cells because I removed that completely from the discussion. So you can also do that and, and see um, all sorts of interesting uh, things about um, how um, an al alternating between a cytostatic and a, a cytotoxic and a cytostatic drug would be much more effective than a cytotoxic drug in certain cases and so on and so forth. But this is way more detail than can fit in one talk. So uh, I'd like to put back the one figure I'd like you to remember, this one. Uh, I'd like you to also think about this science fiction part that is, you know, how do we get close, ex closer experimentally to a point where we get the data that we need in order to do the math? And one thing that I did not really uh, discuss almost at all is, you know, whenever you try to work on new problems, you see new mathematical problems, and that also um, is important. But even more so, maybe, maybe but only maybe we can do something that will be also useful with this math, and uh, that will be very nice. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and, and here, thanks.
Who wants to be on tape, uh, Ursula? Okay, I have more two comments than questions about, I mean, uh, here we are in Marseille, and I have been collaborating a little bit on metronomic chemotherapy with Nicolas Andre group, and mm -hmm. they once sent me a slide when there was a, a analysis of the sensitive and resistant population, very simple, but in, in, in vitro analysis, uh, where uh, the 10% of MTD, so metronomic dose was given and compared with the response to MTD. And the result was that the MTD was, of course, depleting sensitive, almost close to zero, but then the resistance were immediately starts growing. It's almost like the space develop, and the total of both treatments was such that you got more or less the same number of cells, but in the MTD, you got much more of the resistant one because you, they basically replace the, the sensitive ones after the, uh, the MTD treatment. So my question is whether you studied in any way the, the role of MTD. Not, not directly, not with this problem, no. But uh, what you're saying is very consistent with, with what is known, essentially. And one thing I'll uh, definitely recommend um, yeah, there's everyone to do if you have not yeah. done so yet. There is a public talk that was given about three years ago, which you can find online by Tito Foyo, who was uh, at the time at the NIH, but uh, since then moved to Colombia. And it's very interesting because when you think about the, I mean, one of the things that he discusses in this talk, and it is related to all that, is, you know, a patient goes to a doctor and is treated and, you know, it doesn't work. And then treated something, so then the doctor can choose to treat in a different way or not to treat at all, right? And sometimes not treating at all is the best thing you can do. Well, metronomic is not not to treat at all, but to... I know that we're trying to fight that uh, not treating at all, but I, I, I highly suggest that, now metronomic is not part of the study specifically yeah. to your question, and that will be one interesting uh, direction to look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my uh, second comment is actually about your uh, slide with the three questions. I really like the slide, of course, okay. but I wanted to emphasize, it's, I think it will be also a good closing comment for the morning, that we put a lot of, em I mean we, the community puts a lot of emphasis into analyzing the models themselves, and relatively little emphasis to objective if we want to actually optimize the treatment, where your questions were actually addressing ma maximize the damage while uh, uh, maximize the damage while maximize toxicity. Minimize Mathematically, uh, uh, minimize toxicity. Mathematically, you can represent this in many ways, and the mathematical representation really affects the the solutions. If we formulate our objective in the wrong way mathematically, we are getting totally a nonsense as, as far as the uh, expected optimal protocols is concerned. Whereas really there is so much options to be considered that, I mean, the space of all possible controls is Lebeck measurable. So, uh, it, yeah, so it they is, are, and, and yeah. the, the third questions which you had about sequencing is actually a very important one because we encounter with Heinz several, uh, we had discussions with the doctors where actually the issue of the same drugs with the same dosage, how they are given, makes tremendous difference in the outcome. And it's not just together or sequencing, but even like give two drugs, you change by three days or by a week, you start, should you start A first, B then, it or is, should you do the other way around? It is super important. One thing though I will stress uh, is that it is always important to communicate with the clinicians. Um, I've seen all sorts of works, for example, um, you know, the, there's a work where people studied should we first do surgery, mathematically, should we first have a surgery or chemotherapy? Well, 
that's not an interesting question for the doctors, right? They will always do surgery and then chemotherapy unless they can't do surgery and then they'll give mm -hmm. chemotherapy to shrink the tumor and then do the surgery. Yeah. Here, problem solved. I don't need theorems about that. Mm -hmm. But so, so that, that is important. And the other comment I'll make, which does, is not reflected in this talk, really, to be honest, because th this is kind of more, in some sense, a vision than here's my talk where I speak with the experimentalist clinicians and work with their data. But I will still emphasize that if you want to make an impact, it will be good to work on a real problem. That is, several years back, we wrote a paper in which we, this was a review paper on mathematical models of breast and ovarian cancer. It was written with a former student of mine with uh, two doctors, one that does ovarian cancer and with Stan Lipkovich, who is the head of the Women Malignancies Branch at the National Cancer Institute who treats breast cancer patients. And the goal of this paper was to collect, to do a survey of everything that was written in the mathematical community on breast and ovarian cancer. Okay, it's a very short paper. <laughs> it's a very short paper. I'm not talking about bioinformatics. I'm not talking about public health. I'm not talking about epidemiology. I'm talking about mathematical models for something in breast cancer. Now, it's possible that we miss on something, okay? We didn't do that intentionally. We tried to collect everything. You know how many papers have been written in the mathematical community on breast cancer? Less than 15. That, okay, so, uh, you know, we can write many papers on any of these aspects, whether it's drug resistance or tumor growth or whatnot. But if we want to make an impact, we have to go back to breast cancer, or pick your cancer, and work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe just a curious uh, uh, figure you showed about the switch between. Uh, uh, on the spheroid tumor, on the tumor spheroid, uh, when uh, the switch in phenotype that happens, uh, that occurs at uh, some time before the cells diffuse to the rim, how do you interpret this? Uh, how do I interpret? Uh, what is the explanation for you of the switch from constant, apparently, uh, phenotype theta to another constant? Yeah, uh, so, so th this is uh, this, this one. Yes. Yeah, so basically, um, yeah, well, we, we can discuss that, in the, but maybe we do that uh, later. But I can tell you that it, one of the key things is to have cell diffusion, and you need it to be, um, <clears throat> you need it to be relative high. What's plotted here, the difference is actually the difference in the uh, diffusion of the nutrients, not in the diffusion of the cells. So you have here, it's difficult to see, so that's why it's better if we do it later. Uh, so it's a certain balance between the diffusion of the nutrients and the drug and the cells. And it's, this figure is very interesting because this is a work with Hei Rin Cho, who's a postdoc with me, and uh, she did some simulations, got this figure. And she came to me and said, I don't know what's wrong with my simulations. I get this thing, it doesn't look right. And I look back at her and I say, hey, this is the, you know, you, you hit the jackpot. This is what we were trying to see. We wanted to see that a model with that level of complexity, or should I say simplicity, can actually generate these different regions. So actually, I think this is maybe also a figure you may want to remember. Okay, so thank you so much. Thank you very much.